So let's start. Uh, my computer has decided to update <laughs> the last 20 minutes. You know, I, have a, I don't have an Apple, so it takes forever. Um, so we actually start the first two or three, maybe five minutes without slides, because honestly, it's taken 20 minutes so far. Today we're going to speak and discuss quantitating, basically putting some numbers on these um, estimations we're doing. And I know, what kind of background do you have? So how many are taking a like, marketing degree, something like that? How many is the total opposite, like a finance? Yeah. So he's the one wearing a tie, right? You can see he's the finance guy. So, and for the rest of you, I took a marketing degree myself, so I know how it feels. It's like we're coming from this, oh, we need this branding strategy, and suddenly a person like me forces you to put numbers on. But that's the only way we can decide. The only way we can decide whether this is a good business idea or whether we should go uh, do this business idea via online marketing or personal sales is by trying to do some figures. And what we're trying to do today is do an introduction to that. It will, of course, also be the topic of the next sessions where we go through each of the different marketing channels. But we'll try to do it like top down today and try to say, okay, if we had this business idea, how can we try to estimate it a little bit? So basically, You sort of start with an idea, right? So most of us, when we're discussing about a service or whatever, we have this idea, either for a problem that we want to solve or for we already have the solution. And typically, when I speak with people at the technical universities, they sort of have the solution. They have invented something. And when I speak with you, it's more like, oh, this could be nice. It could be nice to have this. Could I have a volunteer, just any kind of idea you, we, we could use an example? Anyone? You look like you have a good idea? Yes, but I don't want to share it. You don't want to share it? <laughs> no. Then we take that as a completely other different se uh, session because that's what really what you have to do to get feedback. Can I have an, another one? You? Business idea? Yeah. Just something that irritates you or something like We just use it. It doesn't have to be your own, just something. Yeah. Like an application that does contracts via blockchain? There's a smart contract. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Classic thing. Um, if we're going to make a contract together, that could be an employment contract, whatever, normally you need to have the sign that verified that it's actually you and me and we want it. So most of you have heard about blockchain and what you can actually do it now, you can do that contract verified by a blockchain. So we don't need a notary to actually go in and verify that it's us. Long story. Does it make sense? So an app for smart contracts, right? Because, but when you have that, you can talk about very, very different business model. Because if I want to make such an app, I could find 100 different ways to make a business out of that. Let's assume I was the expert into blockchains at DGU or whatever. Could, could you come up with a, a suggestions on how we could commercialize this? Just very, very different ways to make business out of that. So if you give me one, of course I could launch an app myself, right? I could put an app in the App Store and try to have consumers to use this. That could be the smartcontracts.io or whatever, and I'm going to launch this, and I'm going to have you as customers, right? That one. What could I do that would be very differently? Yeah. 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 I could say, hey, what I'm really, really good at is the technology, right? Here you're basically, you can say consumer app. So what I want to do is I want to be the best in developing this kind of technology and then I, uh, um, I license it to different companies who then bring it to the market, right? Just very, very simple, same basic idea, but two very, very different businesses. Can you see? Here, 
if I'm going to have you as customers, how much are you willing to pay for such an app? How much are you normally willing to pay for an app? Zero, right? How, how many of, what, what was the last app that you actually paid for? Anyone? Or how many, maybe I should ask. How many of you have paid for more than five apps on your phone? More? Hmm? How many have paid for zero? Yeah. How many apps do you have? Hundreds? Yeah. So you can say, if I'm making this smart contract app and going to sell to you, most likely I would be needing millions and millions of users, and it will be consumer marketing driven, right? And then I hope I have hundreds of millions of users, and thereby I can find one way to monetize that. That could be advertising, can be uh, freemium models, etc. right? Can you see how different this would be? <laughs> Suddenly, if I'm the tech company trying to sell this to banks, how do you think they will pay for it, the banks? Maybe they will. But it's very, very different, right? My marketing cost will not be Facebook ads. It will be hiring salespeople to bring this to the market. And then, of course, will this make sense or not? Will it depend on the financials, right? And this is why you can't go for an idea and try to make a budget. You have to find out what kind of business model are you aiming for? There could be many. And you're trying to do some financial calculations on that. And typically, what you have to find out is, oh shit, it didn't work, right? Or maybe we had all the way back to the ID stage. Does this make sense? So when you are going to make these estimations, you have to find what you initially believe are the business model you go for, including the market segment, et cetera, et cetera. So what we're discussing today is basically not as much this, is that you will have to get your assumptions down regarding this and play with different sales and marketing strategies to find out, does it make sense? And now, finally, I think my computer is ready. So bear with me for one second. Yeah, and now it's updating again. Fantastic, right? It takes several minutes. So, what do you think the hard thing is with that? What, what, are, what, are the, what, are, what do you think of the, the challenge you're having in going from idea to business model? Yeah? Funding, Funding yeah, of course. You'll, you'll sometimes end up situation where you really believe in this. Oh my God, there's really need for that. Well, you quickly realize that you need hundreds of millions of dollars to come to that, yeah? So, so that could be, yeah? What else? Typically, you end up in a situation where you don't have any data. Because if you take something really, really differently, they can say, now we're not talking about the smart contract app. Now we're talking about opening a 7-Eleven down the corner, right? If I'm going to open a 7-Eleven down here, I'll know exactly what my cost base will be because I can go to 7-Eleven and say, well, normally you need two person here. They're having that much cost. You're needing this room to rent, et cetera, et cetera. And since you're based in this specific corner of Fredericksburg where there's that much traffic, we know how much revenue you should be getting here, right? A lot of data. So when you're making these budgets for established business, it's typically long-term, very, very detailed. So if you're going to open in a 7-Eleven down here, you will say, well, the first two years, I know that I will make a deficit, but in year three, I'll break uh, even, because normally it takes some time before the CBS students realize that actually can go over here and buy some nice food. Compare that to this. So when I'm going to do the business model 
canvas or whatever tool you're using, we come back to that, for the smart contract thing. And I ask you, so how many, how much is the, how big is the market? We don't know. How much are people willing to pay? We really don't know. That's why you often end in a situation here where you need to go out and test your assumptions yourself because there's not critical, uh, credible data. And part of that, which we also discussed the first time, is that then you end up in a situation where even if you try to generate the data, it's not valid. Let's take the smart contract app again. So I decided that's a fantastic tool, and I really want to do this app. And I start seeing uh, CBS students as my main initial segment. And I go and talk to you and said, so on a scale to one to five, how much do you want this? Four. Four, yeah. How many contracts do you think you'll sign per year? Fifty. Fifty, yeah, fantastic. And I'll make this fantastic spreadsheet, and 78% of students like it. And it doesn't really have a value, right? So, finally, we can be a little bit loggy. A little bit. If I can just open it. It's fucked up totally. Yes. Now we just need the. It's on? Perfect. Okay. So, the topic for today, now I've gone a little bit through it, will be why talk about this budgeting, how we're going to implement a lean startup approach to this that Build Measure Learn. We'll discuss a little bit about revenue and cost types. And I'm a little bit, where should I start? So when I say contribution margin, how many of you knows how to calculate a contribution margin? How many? Don't worry, I'm not cold call. I'm just curious, honestly. So the rest of you don't know how to calculate a contribution margin? You are in uh, deep trouble. Not here, but in real life. We'll, we'll go a little bit into the different cost types and how to do it. Um, and as I said, we'll talk a little bit about the different sales and marketing channels from a cost perspective. Not too much, because that will be a topic of uh, later sessions. And then what we have approximately at 9.30 is that we have Peter from Firma Fool. Uh, how many of you know about the company Firma Fool? Yeah. You're not the target group, so I guess there's a reason. It's a telco focusing on SMEs. And you can imagine that if you run a, a telco, um, you have to be very, very focused on the detailed figures, right? How much does it cost to get a customer in? How much revenue can we get? How much churn is that? Whatever. And Peter is really, really uh, good at explaining this. He will come at 9.30 and try to put these cost and KPI perspective into real life uh, scenario. Um, some of you already asked about a link to old exam papers. There's a Dropbox link. We will update it with even more papers because one of the issues we had initially were that this was a new course, so we didn't have that many papers. And now we have asked some, some of the old students a permission to use their uh, old exam papers as examples, and we'll upload them into this uh, folder. Um, Let's go back. You have an idea or you're working with an existing company that want to do something new. You start by building your assumptions behind what is it really that you're trying to do. You know, like the extreme examples, do an app, do B2B sales. And then you have to acknowledge that all your assumptions are most likely wrong. So if you believe that you can go to this market by uh, some kind of advertising, it's most likely wrong. If you believe that your target segment is over here, it's most likely wrong, because that's just the reality for innovat innovative startups. Again, the total opposite of the 7-Eleven. Right. 
So therefore, when, when doing this, of course, especially in real life, but also in a class like this, you have to start testing your assumptions. You have to say, well, I believe that consumers are really interested in this, so I can drive them in. What kind of data can you generate to make you believe that this is true? Either a mock-up, an MVP, external data, and so on. We'll talk more about that later. So, um, we'll use an ice cream example today. Because uh, that's very, very easy to understand. Just do it over here. So imagine that, how many of you like ice cream? How many of you are like me trying not to become too fat? So I just invented the perfect thing, right? Ice cream that actually tastes nice with zero calories, right? So how would you bring such a product to a market? In other words, what would be your business model for that? So I'm standing here, I'm this mad scientist who had invented this, let's say, patented recipe for actually making this fantastic ice cream. How are we going to build? Yeah, sorry? Yeah, so we talk about license patent, yeah, to ice cream manufacturer. Yeah, what else? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what else? Yeah. So more like B2B sales. Yeah. Where you basically say, hey, buy my 100 kilos of ice cream, right? Yeah. What else? Yeah, so basically see like a, like a more like a medical product. Yeah. yeah. Which in, in often needs some kind of approvals, trials, data. Yeah? Yeah. So not just consumer product, but a medical product. Yeah, what else? Uh, online. online fitness, yeah. Online sales, yeah. Your fitness ice cream. Yeah, so I could basically uh, find fran franchisees, right? So saying, hey, I'm not going to bring this to the market myself, but I know one in Holland and one in Belgium, whatever, I'll have them to be the one who's selling directly to the consumer, right? Yeah? Yeah, but that's more like a marketing strategy. So are you still going to sell it directly to customers? Yeah. But that's actually one of the points here, right? For each of them, we might be able, after a few glasses of red wine, to find even more, right? But for each one of them, there's many different options, right? So when we say uh, license to ice cream manufacturers, right? We can talk about exclusive deal or non-exclusive deal. If we're going to open a shop, where should we open that shop and how should we market it, right? Um, Medical product, again, very, very different classes. Are we talking about having an approval that you can actually lose weight on this? Or is it more like a real medical product? So there's so many different opportunities. So when we talk here about making a go-to-market strategy and um, quantifying that, it doesn't really make sense. It doesn't make sense to talk about this ice cream here and say, uh, well, what is your budget for that? because these are extremely different ones, right? Your own shop is basically, I'm going to down, have a shop down here at Frederick's Bear, I open this, and I try to get you as customers. Will it be online marketing? Maybe. We'll just maybe try to get flyers at CBS, even though it's illegal, to try to get in and taste it and word of mouth? Maybe. Cost, small cost, small revenue. This one, if I want to have this approved as a medical product, 
is completely different, right? First of all, I need a ton of money to actually get approved. And later on, most likely I'll need to make a license agreement with a pharmaceutical company. So again, your step in an idea is to find out what kind of business are you trying to do and try to have the business model down there. Does it make sense? Because I see this as one of the big things is that people are trying to go directly from an idea and to finances, but that you can't. And you can use whatever framework you want to get this down on paper. I just urge you to get it down on paper. Why do you think I want to have it down, note down on paper your assumptions? Any idea? What's the benefit of that? Get your assumptions down on paper behind, uh, on the business model. Yeah? Yeah, it's easily forgettable, yeah? Yeah? Yeah, something about getting it down, and you also can note if there's something you haven't thought about, right? Because if here we have the business model canvas, right? And basically talking about what is needed to do it, who should you part up with, why should your customer buy it, uh, how are you going to get it to the customers, who are they? Again, you can use whatever, what, whatever framework you want. This is not a theory. It's not a theory saying what you should do. It's just a way for you to make sure that you in an easily way get it down on paper. And now the real work begins, because this is very easy. Now, the real work is when you are having your assumptions out there and you need to start testing them. That's a build measure learn, because you actually have this idea of saying, hey, if I um, can sell this ice cream in bulk, I believe I can make it for two kroner a kilo and I can sell it for 10 kroner a kilo to these retail chains, right? That could be assumption. And they really want it because they can't have anything else. What you then do is you start testing one of those assumptions. Maybe are they really interested in my product? If they are, are they really interested in buying it from 10 kroner a kilo? And how do I get in contact with them? So what you're using a framework like Business Model Canvas or Lean Canvas or whatever canvas you're doing is not as a theory what you should do. It's just to get your notes down. So instead of writing a 50-page business plan, what you're doing is you're filling out these assumptions and then you start testing them. Um, and as, as I, this is basically what I've written down here. What, what I suggest is come up with your idea and start openly to discuss the pros and cons of different models here. What do you really think is the right way to bring this inven invention to the market? And that is all by using a framework like Business Model Canvas or similar. And thereon, you're trying to do some simple calculations. And by simple, I mean something that you can do up here, not something that you need Excel for. Why do you think I advise you not to use Excel as the first step in this process? Any thoughts on that? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. You, you suddenly start thinking about what your rent should be in 2019 or whether you should open stores in Holland or Belgium. Doesn't make sense. Yeah? Yeah. 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 So for, so for instance, when I'm talking to an entrepreneur who has some kind of an idea, I actually meeting with an entrepreneur at 11 o'clock. There's a few things that go through my mind, right? And that is, of course, 
price. How much are customers willing to pay for this? Well, whether it's ice cream or whether it's software or whatever. You know, let's go to my mind, right? How much are they willing to pay? And if you don't have any customers yet, what is it based on? Oh my God, I had invented this and customers will pay $10,000. Why? Have you talked to customers? Have you made any agreements with them? And of course then, I'm thinking about, so if you can sell this for 10,000 kroner, how much does it cost you to manufacture? One kroner or 9,000 9, kroner, right? Big difference. You know, and, now we, and then we're basically back to the contribution market, right? In other words, how much is left on each cell? Of course, I also in my head start thinking about how many can we actually sell? Is this something only for Denmark, or is it a global thing? Is it only for a small niche, or is it a global thing? Ice cream example, right? How much are people willing to pay? I'm thinking about, okay, how can I use analogs in that? Are you normally willing to pay more if it's a low-fat product that tastes the same? Maybe. Uh, what's the pros and cons of uh, B2B sales? That's what's going on in my head. And of course, also the fixed cost here, right? So yes, you can sell a lot, you can have a nice contribution market, but what's the fixed cost? So the reason why I urge you to start in the simple back of the envelope is because you need to do this in your head. You need to think, oh my God, can I sell it for 10 krona and buy it for two, that's eight quarter contribution margin. How much ice creams do I need to sell a year to make this a business? Can you see my thought? And actually what I'm also doing as an investor, I'm starting, you know, when I talk with entrepreneurs, I test them on these. Not because there's a real, real figure, but I want to understand how they think. So, dear Peter, so how many do you think you can sell next year? You know, it's not really whether he says 8,000 or 12,000, it's really how is he thinking? And dear Peter, so you can sell one of those for five kroner, but how much does it cost you to manufacture? Can you imagine if you said, I don't know? I will be a little bit scared. So after you have done these initial calculations, you often need to go back because you find out this does not make sense. For instance, here you can find out that, oh my God, it doesn't make sense to do this as a medical product because I'll meet so much money up front, it cannot justify the market size. That could be interesting. Or if I want to have an own shop, it's, it's really too much effort versus the upside, or whatever. So normally what you're doing is you're going back and forth here. And of course, at some point in time, you, you believe in your figures and you have something, and then you make the more detailed assumptions regarding, okay, now I really have decided that I want my own shop. I need these 1,000 customers a week. How do I get them into that shop? Is it best for me to do online marketing or have ambassadors at CBS or whatever? So start with your idea. Go to your business model, do these assumptions to find out whether it makes sense, and then do the financial calculations later on. Um, so, yeah, let's go a little bit into detail. So what kind of cost you're having and what you have to estimate, of course, differs a lot. Since this class is about sales and marketing strategies, we of course focus on that part. But if you have chosen a project that is still very early and need to be developed, of course you need to include that cost to be able to justify whether it makes sense or not. So this is just a generic way of seeing startups from a funding perspective. So you start here, and this is the cash flow. This is cash flow positive, this is cash flow negative. So this is probably called the, the value of death for startups. Why do you think it's called the value of death? 
Ja. Ja, because often here you need so much money. So go, let's go a little bit into this. Here in the early days, you and two mates have just decided we go all in, we, we do this startup. And to keep it simple, let's, let's call it a software startup. What kind of cost do you think you have in the early days, normally? What do you have? So, you, yeah. Yeah, typically, there could be we can't develop ourselves, so either we hire a developer or we find an outsourcing company that can do one for us. Yeah, that could be. Normally, yeah. S sorry? Yeah, yeah, if you have something that can be patented, then there could be some, some costs related to that, even though for most software startups it's not the issue, but you're right. Of course, also yourself, you might need a salary yourself, right? So typically in the early days, it's actually not that expensive, right? Because you're just playing around. At some point of time, guess what? What kind of cost would you suddenly have here? What? You're going to launch, right? And one of the biggest mistakes I see in CBS papers is that you decided to make this, let's just call it the smart contract app. And what's your total sales and marketing cost? 4,000 kroner or something like that. I kid you not. It's, you know, often I see this. And anyone who has launched a software product knows that if you're going to do a consumer product, you can just ask, yeah, even a B2B one like Fima Phone, ask how much money they have spent. So here it becomes very expensive. So you're not going from two persons. You also need a customer support person. You need online marketing. You need et cetera, et cetera. Of course, if you need a physical product, then you also need to start manufacturing that, shipping, production, etc. So what cost you're having is, of course, different from startup to startup. Um, let's take one of those. Which model should we go for to make some examples here? What, will, what should we play with? Own shop. shop. We make an ice cream shop. So you have decided to go for this ice cream shop. What kind of cost will you have? Rent, the shop. Rent yeah. Staff. Staff. What else? Equipment, Equipment yeah. Operations of electricity. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, what do you call that? Expense, utilities. Yeah? Procedures. Yeah. Yeah. And marketing sales, right? So this is mainly to actually operate the shop, right? This is to manufacture, run it, have uh, employees, whatever. But guess what? Then you have this shop. You need someone to get into the shop, yeah? Yeah, of course you're right. Of course, location can be so much, so this is actually your main channel. Yeah, that's totally right. That's also why from a sales and marketing perspective, when you're talking about different strategies, this is maybe not the most sexy example, but now we've chosen that, right? But you're totally right. If you do that, a big part of that. But again, what I see here is the biggest mistake that we do at CBS when we write these projects is to go into very, very details with that and sort of the customers come by itself. Yeah, they sort of, we have, we, we're having 400 kroner to a press release and then they come by itself. Can you see my point? So if we took another example here, let's just keep this. Imagine that we're going to B2B sales that I want to have sell bulk of this to ice cream shops or other manufacturers who could plant their label on that, to Nestle or whatever, uh, Pardisis, whatever, right? Then m most likely I will have significant costs for attending conferences, 
for hiring sales staff, for uh, have some nice online material, et cetera, et cetera. And again, this is really the focus of today and this course in general. This is where you need to go down into nitty gritty. So if you believe that you can have, let's take some more concrete examples, that many customers, let's take this uh, smart contracts app, right? If you want to say, hey, uh, to make it profitable, I need 100 million users. How are you getting 100 million users? They're not coming by themselves. So before we dig into the sales and marketing cost, let's just take a bit of the upfront cost. For you. How many of you are considering working on an idea that is really in its infancy right now, so you have to sort of produce it or invent it? Yeah. You, of course, have to guesstimate this a little bit, right? Saying, I want to do this software product or hardware product. I haven't done it yet. And again, we're not taking an engineer class here. You just have to do a reasonable guesstimate on that. Will it cost 10 million or will it cost 100 million? Because the focus of this class should be how you're going to bring it to the market. But of course, if you're to, uh, going to have some kind of electronics, try to do an estimate. Both on the variable costs, the cost of goods sold, and also on the upfront production costs. This is an example of one of the companies I've been an investor in, uh, like uh, doing heads-up display, right? And what you could do is, in theory, you can go out and talk to engineers and say, what will it cost to build this? But you can also look at comparable companies and saying, what have they done? Again, this is not the main topic. If you end in a situation where you have some really, really hardcore things to produce in your project, you can always talk to me and we can find ways how to guesstimate the way the right way. This shouldn't be the roadblock for you in this project. Because what I want to focus on is, again, the sales and marketing aspects. Um, but please have in mind, what kind of upfront cost you're having is also depending on your business model. If we're taking this example again, right? Well, you're going to sell your own ice cream to consumers. Well, you can basically just take your receipt here and, and start making ice cream, right? If you're going to do it as a medical product in the totally opposite here, most likely you need a lot of data to verify this is really a nice, serial and, and safe product. And even if you're going to go out to B2B sales, most likely they want, so do customers really like it, et cetera, et cetera. So your upfront cost are being affected by the chosen business model. Um, last thing before the break is price. And price is really, really hard here because it's, a, of course, a central ingredient in does this make sense? And there's the theoretical correct way to do it, and then there's the real world to do it, real world way to do it. Because if you talk with professors in marketing at CBS, they will talk to you about value-based uh, pricing. Have you heard about that? Class about that? Where you know, we're going to price what is worth to you. The only problem with that is, how do we find out? So if I'm doing a 7-Eleven and want to find out how much you're more willing, how high a price you're willing to pay for a liter of milk, because you can buy it at 11 o'clock, I'm 100% sure you can get a valid answer because there's plenty of data. But how much are you willing for this smart contract, blockchain-based smart contract? It's hard. Of course, what you can always look at is analog, right? So if you're going to do something innovative, you'll always have indirect competitors. Even with smart contracts, well, what are people willing to do today? Are they, are they really going to a notary or not? Do you know what a notary is? I'm going to invest in a Slovenia company next week. And I, my signature is not enough, so I have to go down to a notary to verify my signature. Long and costly process. 
But most of us are not doing that. So maybe that's a bad analog, right? Because we are not spending the money on that. But what you should do is, when launching a new innovative product, you're most likely saying, in here, we don't have any competitors because it's innovative. But what you look for is what are customers really doing? So if we take the ice cream example, right? Then you can say, well, are people willing to pay more or less for a diet product if it tastes as good as a non-diet product? I think you can find a lot of examples that people are actually willing to pay a little bit more for that if it tastes well. That's the problem, right? So what you need to do is, when looking for a price, you need to go out here, not for the direct competitors, but for the indirect competitors, to find out what are people willing to pay. It's not easy. But also, that is why it's a trial and error. Because part of that is the build measure learn, where you have to go out and test your assumptions. So if you're going to believe that there's actually an interest for these business to business people, normally they pay 10 krona a kilo for a normal ice cream, and they will actually be willing to pay 12 krona a kilo for your zero calorie ice cream. How can you find out? I think you can find some examples out there, not only by talking to them, but also data in the market. And then the real topic of this course is, of course, how are you going to get in touch with those? That will go. After the break, um, so let's take a 10 minute break now before we start again. So in the first hour, what we spent to uh, have a quick wrap up is idea, business model, financial calculations, right? You, we found out that you need to go through this to be able to do some financial calculations. You can use whatever framework you want. For instance, the business model canvas. But again, this is not a theory saying what you should do. The business model canvas is not saying whether you should sell direct or via channels. And we have this silly example with the ice cream, where of course you need to estimate the other cost. But again, this course has a focus on the sales and marketing aspects of that. So that would be the main topic. So just try to do some reasonable assumptions behind that, but really focus on this. And what I want you to focus on is what are the cost applications of that? Because often it's not a question about is there a market need for this, but it, can we serve that market in a in a profitable way. And actually, apps is the absolutely best example. We use a lot of apps. It's fantastic. Is there an app for this kind of fit? Is there a market for this fitness app? Sure. Can I make money on that? Really, really hard. You can say the same with computer games. How many of you are playing mobile games? Like, whatever, I downloaded some? Yeah? How many have paid for that? Can you make money in computer games? Yeah, it's a huge market, but it also requires some specific sales and marketing channels and strategies to make it work. So this is really what we focus the next eight or nine lectures on is, have you made a thing and saying, when you've chosen one of those, what kind of applications do they have for the sales and marketing and the cost associated with that? Because this will be very, very different companies both from the revenue and cost perspective, and it would be very, very different sales and marketing strategies that work. If you're going to make B2B sales, most likely it's not Facebook ads that work, right? Most likely it's classic B2B sales, participate in trade shows, et cetera, et cetera. If you do a medical product, most likely you cannot bring that to the market yourself if you're a small startup. So what? You need to license it out to a pharmaceutical company. That's another sales and marketing strategy. And the same for a shop. Actually, one of you have a very valid point, saying maybe the space itself is the main sales and marketing channel. Sometimes it is. So Peter will elaborate a little bit on the KPIs. But the first thing you have to know is customer acquisition cost. 
How many of you have heard about that before? Know what it is? Yeah? Good. Because that is the central thing in launching a new product. That is, oh, are there customers for this? But do we, are we able to find customers at a reasonable cost? Right? So let's take one example. Oh, what can I write that down? Here. So what you really want to do, have a customer here, right? And then you are having different ways and often more than one channel to get those customers. That can be online marketing, that can be PR, that can be physical sales reps, it can be the space itself. But that is really, really central. How much does it cost us to get a new customer? For instance, if you're in that mobile game, a mobile app thing, that's the only thing you really care about, saying, oh my God, can I get a customer for $1 or $2? That really makes a difference. And of course, that has to be compared to the lifetime value of the customer. So it cost, my, it cost me $10 to get a customer. How much contribution marketing do I have for one customer? And how many ice creams are that customer going to buy over a lifetime, right? So basically, lifetime value is just what is the potential profit or contribution coming out of that customer over the foreseeable future. So how many of you have uh, had a web shop? None? Are you saying that? Yeah, yeah you had, yeah. Um, so can we just use you as an example? You don't have to disclose any confidential thing. But that was jewelry, right? Yeah. So what is your main uh, way of getting customers into the shop? Social media, right. So you are, when you say social media, I guess 99% it's Facebook, right? So you're having your Facebook ads where you are knowing that on average it'll cost you X krona per click, something like that. We say it's cost you one krona, right? And then people are either liking your stuff or going to, you're sent directly to the website. And then I guess that on average you're, um, conversion rate on your website is something like 2 to 3%, right? So you don't have to be rocket science to realize here that if you pay one and it's only one of 50 or one of 33 that actually buy, then you have a high, uh, higher acquisition cost here. So that will be like the 33 to 50 krona on your acquisition cost. So if that makes sense from a customer's perspective, Either your contribution on that one customer buy is higher than that, or that the customer buys many times, right? It's like when you are um, buying subscription or whatever. What, what do you have subscription on? Netflix or something like that? I can own, uh, what, what's the price for Netflix? 69 krona or whatever, right? I can almost guarantee you that Netflix customer acquisition cost is higher than 69 krona. But they are betting on that you are a customer of what, two or three years, meaning that your lifetime value is maybe 2,000 krona, right? Does it make sense? So when we're talking about sales and marketing strategies, it's actually all the time the customer acquisition cost versus the lifetime value of the customer that is essential. So when we're talking mobile games and when we know that most of us are not paying for that, they're betting on that they can get one of you by word of uh, mouth marketing or f social marketing, whatever, very, very cheap. And then they hope that just one of you are paying for actually the premium version of Candy Cross or whatever. So this is really the topic of this course, is that you try to guesstimate on these different channels for your specific business model what is the most realistic way for getting these customers? And if we go a little bit into that, also based on some of the mistakes I see, one of the classic things is uh, 
we are having, uh, we're launching this product that could be software or whatever. Our main marketing channel is, our, is uh, social media, right? Yeah, but that's not coming for free. Has any of you had a part-time job working with social media? You know, yeah. And I guess that, uh, can I, can I, is it a, as an agency or your own thing or is it a part-time job or? Part-time job. Can we say what com company it is? What type of company? Uh, it is in, uh, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Okay, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Very, very sexy. I like that page all the time, right? Um, so, so we all hope that we will have these million of, of likes or whatever. It will be fantastic, right? But in real life, it doesn't happen. Right? Normally, actually, you hire a person to actually curate the content, put blogs, whatever. And then you boost the post and all that. So when you see a consumer brand with 200,000 likes, I can guarantee you that it costs a lot, right? So if that's your marketing strategy, you can say organic social media, where you're sort of not running ads to bring to the website, but more like, how long time has it been like that? Yeah. Shit. Well, it's on my computer here. But nothing really happens. That's really bad timing that the projector doesn't work. Yeah. For some reason, it went off the display, so it should be on in a minute. I actually had a fantastic slide. So, um, let's just hope that it starts. It will. So, if we go a little bit more into, now it comes. So you didn't see those lights, but they were really, really fantastic and beautiful, right? So my point is just, you have a Facebook page, it doesn't just go viral, include the cost. So what kind of cost when you're doing the budgeting? To keep it very, very simple, typically you have fixed sales and marketing costs and variable sales and marketing costs. So for, for your jewelry company, when you are running your Facebook ads, they are totally variable, right? You can sit here and even in class, you can do the app and you can uh, shut them down, right? So you know exactly what the price will be and you know exactly after time that it will cost you X krona to get a visitor to your site or a like. But what you also need to include is all the fixed costs. So let's assume that I actually have hired a social media assistant at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs well, guess what? She won a salary, well, you sell something or not. And often in your budgeting, you have both costs, right? Because yes, you need to run the ads, but you also need persons to do it. You also need some assistance there. Remember that. Um, and then in general, try to work in this funnel perspective. Because that's not a sales and marketing strategy that there's about likes. If you want to, to do a sales and marketing strategy, it has to be what does it cost to bring a customer in. And many of us who are working this on a daily basis, we found out that basically any channel is really, really hard. I guess you can vouch for that also, that the competition for Facebook ads have gone up a lot, right? So it's not just like, hey, I'm just running those ads try to find out what kind of data that is already there. Because it doesn't take a long time to find out what does a uh, page visit cost you and what's the um, uh, conversion rate. And compare that to what kind of price and contribution marketing are your customers paying for your product? 
So I can find a lot of products that for sure that if I put Facebook ads out there for you, you buy. But typically, I end up with a uh, custom acquisition cost here of hundreds of kroner, and you only do or you only having contribution margin for maybe for 50. That's what this course is about. That you actually understand that yes, this is a fantastic marketing channel, not just for this product. So. Um, if we do on a little bit more on this organic thing, so are any one of you running your own Facebook uh, Facebook pages, commercial Facebook pages here? For what kind of product, if I ask? Um, for the organization here at CBS. For the organization at CBS, yeah. For student organization? Yeah, student organization. Yeah. So one of the things that happened there, right, originally when you had one of those and you made an update, it will be in the feed of everyone, right, who liked it. Guess what? That's not how it is anymore, right? Because the competition, there's so many ads in there, so Facebook has said, hey, I'd rather have you actually to pay to reach your own audience, right? Yeah, like yeah something like that. So this is also known as the law of shitty click-through, right? Because when a, when, a, when a channel becomes so popular, everyone is competing for that, so the reach is getting down and down. It reminds me a little bit when we start with uh, uh, web, and, uh, web um, ads in uh, late 1999 or something like that. You can have click rates of several percent. So when you put an ad up, 5% of all visitors will click. And maybe I can ask you, when is the last time you actually clicked one of those ads? You know, not by mistake, but actually click it by purpose. It's zero point, what is that now? Zero point zero whatever. Anyone who have more updated figures than me. And again, this course today works as an introduction to the next ones. Um, has anyone of you worked with PR? Like real PR getting in the media? Because it sounds perfect, right, from the outside. Sounds so perfect. I write this press release and then I send it to the media, and this journalist are putting it in, and I get free PR, right? Fantastic. So uh, how do you think, this is actually a real case for one company I created, it's a sperm quality test kit, and they got in uh, a lot of uh, press coverage in some, uh, some journals. Also paid ad, I think. So can you imagine how much work that is involved in that? What do you normally do? Yeah. Yeah, it depends, right? Because we're not talking about paid ad now. We're talking about the, 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 the press article, right? So for instance, if you go to Burson or whatever and take one of the front pages of the business newspaper today and you see the courage of one company, it's not co coming there just by coincidence. It's normally coming because you're actually hiring a PR consultant who's chasing down the journalist and say, dear journalist, this story is perfect for you. You get it exclusive, right? Can you see my point? So free PR doesn't exist because you need to put a lot of effort into that. So for instance, when we hired for this launch of this, in, in, that was also in Denmark, we hired a journalist and we actually got her on a no cure, no pay, or a consultant, and it was something like, for each time we were in the news, we paid five to 10,000 kroner. So remember to include the cost also PR. And guess what? So you get, this is time, and this is how many visitors you're getting. Has anyone you had your company in the press, like in a major newspaper or something like that? Yeah, what kind of company? Yeah, so the, was it in the tech media, like this new startup is the new thing? Okay, yeah. Because normally what happens is, right, you're getting a lot of visitors that day, right? So you see this article, really, really nice. 
you go to the visit to the page, right? And the day after, nothing, right? Nothing. So if you have such a strategy, of course you can say, well, we're betting on we'll be in the press on a regular basis. But it's just harder next time, right? The first time we say, we're the first in the world who launched this. It's really, really hard afterwards. We actually have Peter from Autobotler in as a guest speaker, and he'll tell how they build up their um, PR strategy. But you remember the cost, but also try to estimate the effect. Uh, for instance, if you, were with, if you had a web page that had one million, 1 million visitors, right? That could be a leading newspaper. How many of those one million is actually reading that specific article? So you can take Exterblad in Denmark, right? One of the leading tabloids in Denmark. I guess it's not all one million. So how many are, are, are reading that article? Maybe 100,000? How many of those 100,000 actually say, oh my god, this is so interesting. I really want to have that product. So they go to the web page, 2,000, maybe? I'm just guessing. How many of those 2,000 actually press buy? 1%? Can you see my point? That suddenly this fantastic article, oh my god, we came into Exoblad or whatever in Denmark, or actually we had this product that was in the, the leading online. Um, anyone here from the UK? The leading on Daily Mail, or something like that, one of the, the leading uh, UK newspapers online. We had a fantastic article in that saying, launching the world's first valid sperm, sperm test or something like that. We're talking about a site that has millions of monthly users, millions. How many actually pr press buy on the web page, you think? Any guesses? I think we had 300 customers buying the next day, right? So I'm just saying, if you're launching something and believe that only PR is your marketing strategy, you really need to have a credible story here because it's really, really hard. World's first sperm quality test. Then one week later, uh, yeah, we're still world's first. I don't know. Can you see my point? And then, of course, many of us will say, oh my god, we don't do that. We're just doing organic search, like search engine optimization. We also have that. And then I'll just say, is it credible for you? I just ran this. This is, uh, I think, a search for children's clothes in Denmark. So look at that. The first one, two, three, four is already paid. And then the first organic is Zalando. Do you think Zalando has spent quite a lot of money on search engine optimization and basically have a high pay rank? So if you come to me and say, Nikolai, I'm going to launch this children's uh, clothes stop, uh, store in Denmark, and I'll be number one. I don't believe you. That's not the same that you can't do it. But I'm just saying it's about uh, um, trading cost and revenue. Can I ask you are, you, are you spending money on search engine optimization? <coughs> yeah, is it working? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And typically it's about, hey, I need to hire that consultant who do this, and maybe there are some search words that, that are not that competitive, so I can up the ranks, but is the search vo volume large enough? So I'm not saying that you shouldn't do it. I'm just saying, I guess there's a reason why most of these companies are not having that as their only choice, because this is something you can do 15 years ago. 15 years ago, there were not that many shops trying to sell you all kind of things. But if you can prove me that there is a market that is a high search volume and not that many competition, well, it could be. 
Because one of, normally one of the problems is that if you do something really, really innovative, you're not searching for that, right? I might have invented a flying car, but I don't think that you'll be sitting there at Google and say, where can I buy flying cars? And then the paid search, which is, of course, this one up here. That is actually very easy to do the math on, right? Because you can go to Google um, uh, Keyword Planner and find out what does your keyword cost. If your keyword is jewelry to women in Denmark or whatever, you can find out both how many are searching for that and what's the cost. And then you do the math and find out what does one customer cost you. Has anyone of you ever worked as a physical salesperson? Not in the shop, but like, like sitting in a car and, yeah? Can I ask what you sold? What kind of boxes? Of, of what, what kind of product? Sorry, I can't hear it. Food product. Food product, yeah. Yeah, so you basically went and say, are you interested in that? Yeah. Yeah, that's a little bit different because door sales is not allowed in Denmark. But yeah, but you can, right. So how many, can, how many new customers could you get per day, you think? <laughs> Two? Yeah. Yeah. So... You can do the math there, right? So he could get, on average, two new customers a day. And I guess they're hiring young people because they have a lower cost. So I guess a f total cost for you per day include, was it in a car or, or, or just? Yeah. So the cost for you, uh, for hiring you, including social costs, whatever, had might have been, what, two or 300 euro a day? Meaning that if you do that rough thong, then one customer will cost me 100 euro, right? So customer acquisition cost for that will be 100 euro. And it was a subscription, you said? And how, uh, how much was the price for the subscription? $69. Yeah, per month? Okay, yeah. So 69 US dollar per week. Right? And it's food, I'm just guessing, maybe there's a contribution of $20. I'm just guessing, right? So it costs $100 to get you, to get a customer. $20 a contribution, I'm just guessing. And they got the first two one free, you said? Yeah. So basically two one free, and then you need to pay, right? So we both need to have the cost for that. So on average, eight, nine, 10 weeks, then you had a break-even point, right? If people are, are, are ordering plus 10 boxes, then you're good. Can you see my point? It's relatively easy to come to a point where you can calculate, well, this one makes sense. But you can also see there's a lot of products that $100 acquisition cost doesn't make sense. There's a reason why there's no one, uh, well, both for legal reasons, but why could we give example? Why could it make sense to call you if we were allowed? Yeah, maybe a bad example. B2B sales, uh, that's really what I'm involved in. So B2B sales is any, anything from a subscription of $19 a month to selling enterprise software, example, right? So if I'm going to hire a sales rep and drive around in Denmark and get customers. You know, that costs typically, yeah, easily, what could be per day? Doot, 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 doot. Three, four, five thousand Danish kroner a day, right? With salary, car, gas, et cetera. How many customers can I get? Right? In many cases, none, or one. So if I can get new, one new customer a day, driving around, that customer acquisition cost may be two, three, four, five thousand Danish kroner. So either you need to sell really, really expensive software or have a long, long subscription on that.
uh, we talked about that already. I would like to spend the last seven, eight minutes on a real case, and then I can tell how we work with different strategies and go to market. I just put on some of the companies I'm involved in now. Which one should I choose? I can take uh, virtual reality, I can take computer software, we can have uh, thinking hats, software, sperm quality test, electronics. What should I choose? VR. VR. Okay. VR is this one. They actually changed now to meeting VR. So we are doing Skype for next generation Skype, you can call it. VR based Skype. When you say we, I talk like it's my company, I'm just an investor, but I'm so into it, right? So it's not my company, I'm not the inventor. We're going from, so you can say, if you just imagine that the idea is VR collaboration. And if we take two very different business models, we can say B2B and B2C. We are up here. What do you think would be the main difference between sales and marketing strategy for B2B versus B2C here? Yeah. So we, here we sell a license, right? So here it's, um, you can say seats or whatever you call it, you know. So it's, uh, yeah, what should you say? <laughs> Bulk is not the right word. Um, uh, higher price, right? Because there's many seats, right? So here I'll go into the saying, hey, dear company, you have 100 employees. I would like to make this software for you. You can get a license, right? So if I should do it to consumers, most likely it would be free, right? Initial, at, at least in Italy where I said, hey, you can get this free version now. What other difference would there be, you think? Yeah, exact, that's exactly what we're trying to do. You can, get, you can get pilot customers, which is important for cash flow. Because as you're totally right, you're saying, hey, dear company, normally this would cost you 100,000 euro a year. You are a pilot customer here. We work with you to make this fantastic product. You only have to pay $20,000. Yeah, what else? Yeah, which one do you think? Yeah. Uh, or Network, mails, uh, LinkedIn. You're right. And, and of course, these two fit together, right? Because when you have something that is free or like a freemium model, you can't go out and say, can I send a, a person to visit you even though you're not paid? That you can do in the B2B market. So typically, that's how these are linked together is in the B2B market, I know that that customer over there, even though they're located in Brøndby or whatever, they have a market potential of 10,000 kroner a year, therefore I would like to visit or call them. Well, if I'm going for the consumer market, it has to be something that is cheaper, more scalable thing where I can sort of get the customers in and they can also sort of auto sign up, right? Because here we really work with them. So what, what we're trying to do, or what the company is trying to do, exactly what you're saying, is that we have a long-time vision of actually having something where even companies sign up themselves, but we don't really know what they really want, right? Now we're back to what is really their need. We say we are Skype and VR, but what do we really need? Is it really the advertising agencies that are the best, or is it the architects that are the best? We don't know. So the way we are doing all go-to-market strategy is actually saying we are trying to have pilot customers which we work together with. Our goal is over the next year to have 50 pilot customers that will be B2B companies. We work with them and find out what do they really need 
and can we really solve that? And during that process, we'll most likely find out that there are some segments we can't really solve or, or, or serve, so we only go after those. This is a very demanding process, but since we only need 50, we can hire two salespersons whose only job is actually to go out and contact these companies via uh, uh, existing connections, via LinkedIn, via email, a little bit social media, but that not much, and say, we can do something for you in VR. If we had been a B2C company, we had to find out how we quickly would be able to get a, a lot of users for free and how we could convert some of those free to some, some premium features, right? That would be very different. I'm not saying what's right or wrong. I'm just saying we have decided on this one. That means a lot for what kind of channels we're using. No. You, you can say, it's really depend what you're trying to build. If you're going to build the next Facebook, if, that, is that, if that's your dream, right? To build something that could be extremely big uh, with a high degree of risk, they will not. Most likely you need to have something like this or some B2B that is easily scalable. What I really like about B2B is that I can build a product, I can find 50 customers, and I can sit with them and find out whether they really like it, and I can get money out of that. That's what I like. If you go to US venture capitalists, what they really, really like is the totally opposite. I have something like here. I don't know what will work. I'll most likely have a break-even point when we reach 100 million users. I try to get it out there. We, we spend $10 million and see whether it floats or sinks. Can you see my point? So, for instance, that's why I'm really into this, but I'm also involved in another company. I'm involved in, as an investor in Forgotten Anne. That is computer game, consumer com computer game. This is like the lottery. I don't know. We're launching, I think it's been delayed. I think it's launched now in February. And you can do some PR up front and some marketing, but honestly speaking, you will know within three or four days will be success or not. You know, and that's different. That's different channels, right? That is working with YouTube bloggers and, and stuff like that. But it's really different. So there's nothing right or wrong. But it's for sure very, very different companies you're building. Very, very different companies. And I guess Peter can also explain in the, in the telco business how I guess it's very different from running a B2B focused telco to running a B2C focused telco. What's the right one? You know. Any questions so far? Yeah. I'm a little part time with the LTV, right? Yeah. I, I don't fully understand. Okay. So we're assuming that it has some kind of lifespan. Yeah. Per customer. Yeah. And we estimate that based on. On well, that could be industry facts. For instance, uh, well. If you're getting a customer in any type of industry, for instance, I talked with an alarm company the other day because I really want to disrupt that industry. And in the alarm business today, they know if they get a customer, that customer is a customer for more than 10 years. So of course, if you launch to have, you need to do some kind of assumptions. And there are typically data out there on, on how people churn. Peter will also, I guess, talk a little bit about churn in the telco. So if you're going to launch a new a uh, telco operator in Denmark. I can guarantee you that the cost to get a customer in will be much, much higher than the first month use. But they know that if we are a successful company that do good to customer service, whatever, you'll be a, a customer for maybe two or three years, right? So don't worry about this. You just assume something. I'm not, it's not like, of course, if you assume that all your customers are customers for 120 years, I might say, hey. But come up to me if you have any questions. But it's not really, it's not the exercise we're looking for in calculating the perfect, because we don't know. But just do some reasonable assumptions. Yeah, yeah, we will come. So let's take the break now, and I'm sure that Peter can tell more about that. Cool. So meet in 10 minutes.